Okay, Courtney, you can go ahead. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome and good evening to those of you in other parts of the world. So um, my name is Courtney Aldrich, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of ACS Infectious Diseases. And we're really excited um, for you to join us today for our second um, Zoom pop-up meeting featuring two young scientists. Um, I just wanted to give a little background on the journal since this still is a relatively new journal in the ACS portfolio, and it was presciently, presciently launched in 2015 with the recognition that chemistry plays an important role in infectious disease research. We all know that as chemists, and, but there was no journal at the time that really recognized the importance. So we've grown, um, we're now in our seventh year, and we cover really all aspects of IED research uh, that have um, some composition of chemistry. We, we talk about pathogens and host pathogen interactions. We cover therapeutics, vaccine technologies, molecular diagnostics, and even novel drug delivery systems. So now let's see. Oh, let me move on Next slide here. Okay, so I'm going to switch over and I'm going to introduce our editor, uh, Pete Tung, to give us a little overview of the format. Yeah, thanks, Courtney. So as we know, a major part of scientific growth and development involves going to conferences and interacting with peers and leaders in your research field. And you get an idea of the breadth and depth of science out there. It's, it's amazing. It's an amazing experience. I still have very fond memories of my first conferences and one in particular in which uh, Bill Jenks, who is a very well-known entomologist at Brandeis, uh, grilled me for 30 minutes at my poster. So unfortunately, of course, this has been impossible over the past 18 months. And only now are we getting back to in-person conferences, many of them in hybrid format. So let's hope that continues. Of course, this has been particularly hard for those of us beginning, those people beginning their scientific careers. And these webinars are an attempt to engage junior scientists and give them the opportunity to share their work. Um, although this does not make up for the inability to attend conferences in person, it's a small step in the right direction. And our idea is that this webinar series should be organized and sustained by students with the support, of course, of the American Chemical Society. So please let us know if you're interested in being involved. Um, so this is the second webinar in our, in our student um, speaker series. Yeah, thank you, Pete. Um, and so today we have two speakers and we'll um, go introduce one at a time, just highlight the first one is Yuan Wan Qian. He's a graduate student in the laboratories of Shaviar Mabashri, Marilyn Chang at the University of Notre Dame. And he's a chemist and he'll give the first talk. And the second one we'll hear from Will Ferraro who's a PhD candidate in Dr. Perez's research group at the University of Virginia. And so I will stop sharing and Yuan Wan, please upload your slides. I thank you, Dr. Arich. Okay, could you see my slide? Okay. Uh, Hello everyone, my name is uh, Yuan Yuan Chen. So today I'm gonna to talk about the design synthesis and the biological evaluation of quinzonal antibacterial against methylene resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which also brief as MISA, MRSA. However, before I introduce you to the MRSA, I would like to show you this timeline of key antibody resistant events. So as you can see here, right before the penicillin was put to actually put to use clinically, the antibody resistant is already an issue. So in the 50s and the 70s, as we can see, it's a golden era for the antibiotic discovery where we discovered uh, major classes of antibiotics. However, in the late, after the late, 80, uh, late 80s, there the, thing, the trend actually take a shifted turn because we see that because of the, white, uh, the widespread usage of the broad spectrum antibiotics, we see the, uh, we saw a lot of uh, outbreak of uh, different kinds of uh, drug resistant pathogens. And in 2019 and 2020, uh, both CDC and the World Health Organization issued their list of uh, drug resistant pathogen list that needs, uh, con that needs concerns. And uh, right now uh, in the United States alone, around 3 million people are, affect are infected by the, by the drug resistant pathogen yearly and uh, around 50,000 50, cases of death are caused by the drug-resistant pathogen infection. 
And uh, we know that uh, those, all these pathogens are mainly consist of gram positive uh, bacteria and gram negative bacteria. So here is the first poll question for you. Hey, Lori, could you help me pull up the poll question, please? Thank you. Yes, absolutely. So we will start with the first poll question. And the question is, um, sorry, what is the annual mortality rate of gram positive bacteria infections in the US? And you have um, five options here. So we'll give everyone a few seconds to respond. Okay, I see we have a lot of answers coming in. We're gonna close the poll shortly. And we're gonna close the poll in about 10 seconds. And we're gonna close the poll in three, two, one. All right, back to you. Thank you, Lauren. Okay, so I see uh, most of the people actually got it right. So the, the number is around the 30,000 cases to 35,000 cases. Although gram negative one are noxious for their, I mean, hard treat, it's really hard to treat, but the gram positive one bacteria actually cause the, the most of the problem here. And uh, MRSA is kind of one of the leading causes here, which causes uh, 10,000 cases of life uh, every year in the United States. So um, different a new option, treatment option for the MRSA in, uh, infection is in a dying need. And the, before, so the resistance of MRSA actually came from this exact protein, uh, penicillin binding protein 2A. So for the normal uh, uh, PBP 2A, so for the normal PBPs, they actually only have, they only have active site in interested domain, which can interact with the alien structure, which is, is the terminus of a glycogen Glyco, uh, glycan, pedoglycan strand. So it helps, this protein helps constructing the bacterial cell wall. So the classic beta lactams mimic such structure and covalently inhibit this active site. So it actually stops the uh, inhibition, uh, stop, inhibit the bacterial cell wall synthesis. The interesting part of PBU2A is that it, it has a lot of, is the active site of the confirmation of the active site normally closed. And it has a lot of site. It is discovered in our lab that when this when you occupy this active site, a lot of site with a certain molecule, it can open up the active site and let antibody to bind in. And in 2015, Dr. Buller in our lab discovered discovered the quinazolinol antibacterials, which is active against MRSA. And we found in this critical structure and it's a, a PDP inhibitor. And in this critical structure, we found that this compound can bind as a lotric site and open up the active site. However, in this structure, we didn't find any beta uh, uh, antibiotics in it. And then Dr. Bully did a first round of uh, structure activity relationship study. So for from this SAR study, what we there the takeaway information is that there, it can be divided in two parts. The first part in red is the one that's supposed to form a specific interaction with its target. More like which which uh, includes the hydrogen bonding and IS6 interaction as showcased in this crystal structure. So the rest of the part mostly it contributes to the non-specific lipophilic interaction. So when I start to try to do the second round of SAR exploration, what I have to keep in mind that I need to keep a balance between the potency and the lipophilicity and try to decrease the toxicity and the plasma protein binding rate, which is a kind of problem for this series of compound. And what I do is I modify the A ring, B ring, and the E linker. So following a three steps of synthesis, right here is my first panel of the SAR. So as you can see here, for the A ring here, I try to uh, replace the bending ring with the heterocycles. And uh, for the initial screening, we actually screen the compounds against the normal SRA strain. And we use MIC, minimal inhibitory concentration, as the main indicator. When the MIC is lower than eight micrograms per milliliter, we consider it to be active and I labeled them in blue here. 
So because we want to lower control the lipophilicity uh, of this uh, compound, so generally we use C log T and C log D well, as one of the main indicators. While we're doing the MIC test, we also actually add another protocol. We, we have another batch added 0.5% of bromine serine albumin to see the binding of the compound with the DSA to mimic the plasma protein binding. So as you can see here, although these compounds are quite inactive, when, you, when they have show up higher C log P, and they, when they also showed a big reduction uh, when in the presence of MIC in the presence of BSA, you can see that this leads to very high plasma protein binding, which are not, which are not desired. So following on, let's uh, go to our second panel. So this is the most important panel of this uh, exploration. And when we're doing this kind of exploration, we found that we, our group actually managed to uh, got another critical structure between the PPP2A and the quinazolinose. As you can see here, this compound also bind at the allosteric site and made some movement on the blockchain and open up this active site. And this time we actually observed uh, beta-lactam covalently bind into this uh, active site. If you compare the poses of this two, uh, of this, uh, two compounds in two different uh, crystal structure. We find that it's rather different. And what concerns me is that you can, if you check at the B ring, the orientation of the B ring, it's kind of flipped. So it actually increased our interest in modification on the B ring well with the capsulic acid intact, leaving uh, capsulic acid intact. So which leads us to compound 73, which generally show a better uh, fourfold, around fourfold uh, antibiotic and the bacterial effects uh, comparing to the first initial compound against the normal SRA strain and the MRSA strains. And I also tried to use the intermolecular antibonding to fix the orientation of the B ring, like this compound. However, most of the compounds are inactive. Then it's actually triggered me to think about another role of this compound rather than just antibacteria. Maybe let's just see it as a, a lost site inhibitor. So that's why I try to use at uh, adjuvant along with oxaline, another beta-lactam, beta-lactam uh, uh, bacteria, which is not active against MRSA. So we use this combination against a MRSA strain to see if this compound can boost up the antibacterial effects of the oxaline. However, only 83, compound 83 have such effect, but we also see that MIC of such adjuvants also uh, decrease. So this effect might be just uh, might not be synergistic. Uh, synergistic. So then I just I follow up with a checkboarder uh, a checkboarder essay and which confirmed my thoughts. And the later and the following on, we actually did uh, several other alternations on the on the based from from the one that contained the capsulic acid. As you can see, we have a bunch of compounds that is active. And the outstanding one is the one that with the sulfonic, uh, sulfonamide. What you can see is here, this compound is, con this moiety is considered to be a uh, isobiosphere of capsulic acid. And this one uh, generally increase uh, the antibacterial effect by tenfold while decrease the C log P. But we still want, uh, but we still want to make, make a thought out of it. So I may make a pro drug here as you can see, and uh, which uh, lower the C log D to 2.53. And generally, this is uh, this one compound is very active against the MRSA as well. And uh, sorry, and moving on, let's lead us to the third panel. For the third panel, I want what I do is do some automation on the linker. So I want to replace the double bond. But as you can see here, those active ones generally are the ones that they rather has a rather hydrophobic um, hydrophobic linkers. And when it comes to a hydrophilic linker, as you can see here, when I replace the double bond to the one with amide, it actually have a 30 fold decrease regarding the antibacterial effects. However, I already know how to do modification to increase, uh, to increase its antibacterial effects. So, so I put the amido group on, on top of that and which leads to uh, compound 122, which has a relatively low um, uh, MIC and the C log D is reduced to 2.6. So, in all, uh, we had uh, seven finalists, which has a uh, re relatively better um, antibacterial effect compared to compound one. And then we follow up with XTT essay to uh, determine the cellular toxicity 
of our compound. And when we use the IC50 of XTT assay divided by MIC uh, as an indicator for the safety profile uh, for our compounds. And you can see all these compounds actually show um, a better, um, better safety profile compared to the compound one. And uh, when it comes to plasma protein binding, uh, most of the compounds sustain a reasonably low uh, plasma protein uh, binding rate, while compounds 106 uh, reduce the uh, rate to 68%. However, uh, because this compound along with uh, compound 100 has a very low uh, solubility, so we didn't continue with the in vivo uh, assays. So then we follow up uh, the uh, fast pharmacokinetic assay in mice with all the rest compounds. And uh, so we found that we want to see like when these compounds are administrated in vivo, uh, in, but through IV, how is the ex systemic exposure of this compound? And we found that the compound 73 is only one has a high systemic AUC and uh, low clearance. So we, we have no choice but to just uh, go on with 73 along the one. We're comparing the full key PK as, uh, parameters between these two compounds. We can find that when, when this compound is taken orally, you can see that it behaves much better than compound one. So in return, it actually has a better oral viability. So, but the difference didn't actually stop there because we, I restricted rethinking the role of this uh, quinazolinol. So I actually use this compound, try to use it uh, in combined with, uh, with other antibiotic uh, choices. So what do we use here is TZP, which is a combination uh, of a beta lactam and a beta lactamase inhibitor. So it's a quite viable option to treat SRS infection. However, it's inactive against MRSA. And uh, we try to use a combination with this uh, quinazolinol in the uh, time kill assay. And uh, from this assay, we find that only the combination between 73 along with uh, TZP can perform uh, bactericidal uh, effects over this uh, MRSA strain. And which you can see here in this uh, red line here, it actually have a three log uh, detection regarding the colony forming units. And while the compound one could not do that. And we transfer this finding to the neutropenic site infection study in mice. And as you can see here, it has the same effect. So, we know that this, this synergy is not, not only showed up in vivo, it's also effective in, in, uh, in vitro, it's also infected in vivo. So in summary, we, we think that this compound could allosterically control the active site of PP2A, open it up and let the PIP, uh, let the beta lactam to bind. And in all, the, this combination showed a bactericidal synergy. And uh, that's the probably end of the talk. So this, uh, this work is actually supported by NIH grant. And uh, I, I was under, personally under uh, support uh, from the training grant from the CBBI program. And right now I'm an ex-fellow. Thank you very much. That's the end of my talk. All right, Yuan Wan, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Beautiful talk. Uh, nice to see the story. Uh, I read your paper, so I was it's nice to see it in person. Um, I'll start off. Um, it's also online asking some questions. I have a question from Lynn Silver. Um, she wants to know if your XTT assay um, was done in the presence of serum, and she suggests that you should compare the IC50 to the MIC in the presence of an equivalent amount of serum. Oh, I, uh, we didn't put the serum in the X, when we were doing the XTT assay. Oh, you did not? Yeah, I think we did not put the serum in it. Okay. Yes. Uh, but you did mimic the um, protein binding by adding bovine serum albumin. In the oh, that's MIC when we were doing the yeah MIC uh, assessment. We so, uh, here, yes, yes. But it's, uh, yes. Yeah. So the question this is really not a question, a statement. But you should make sure that you use those, do these experiments in the equivalent amount of serum that you measure cytotoxicity. The you know. Oh. TT or XTT assay, because you can, mm -hmm. um, um, the, okay. So I had a, actually on this slide, I had a question that's what's interesting, compound 54 has a really high um, protein binding, but you see the shift, the MIC shift is relatively small. It's very interesting. Can you comment on that? You mean 54? Yep. 
You mean this shift is slow? Uh, it's more it's also compared to the protein binding. Uh, uh, yeah, yes. For for that, I I, I can't. Yeah, so then. So I never think of that regarding this one, but uh, no, I don't think I have a good answer for this one though. Yes. Um, okay. I guess it's I, I think it's, it's not like linear, that's I can say, but it's a, it's a useful uh, indicator regarding the reduction, but um, I, I don't think it's a linear. So that's, that's my uh, yes. thing in this. I think, um, the that represents you're seeing, but it's it suggests it's more reversible. The protein binding, um, many compounds that are really lipophilic, you have irreversible binding, and then you get a huge shift. But yours doesn't show a very large shift, so that's very nice. Okay, I have some more questions for you. Um, Pete, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, I was just going to add a comment actually. In my many travels to uh, drug companies, especially those those developing antibacterials. Anecdotally, there are many examples where you see very small shift in MIC despite very high protein binding. And I'm not sure that there's a really good mechanistic explanation for that. Um, of, of course, it's common to see what you see for 56, where you see a big change. But also there are examples where you see a small change and people, I mean, honestly, there isn't really a good mechanistic explanation for that. Um, the, I guess I'll, I'll change slightly and talk about mechanism of action. So there was, there was a question about your checkerboard assay and exactly what is that showing? What's the purpose uh, of the checkerboard assay and what did you learn? Check, from checkerboard assay is to try to determine if uh, this, uh, when you combine this uh, compound together at different uh, concentration, you want to see if this, they have a synergistic effect. So in this case, so we use the FIC fractional inhibitory concentration as the indicator. So it's in between this uh, two values, 0.5 and 4. It means it's indifferent. So it, in this case, it actually means that those, the effects, they are addictive. So because you know the concentration I use here uh, of the adjuvant, it's 60 micrograms per milliliter. Uh, so it's, uh, and the MIC I test, on, uh, surprisingly, it's actually 32. And uh, so it, it, this, uh, the, the, um, the MIC of the, the antibacterial uh, effects of this compound actually contributes to the final results here. So it's additive, but it's not injected. If it's synergetic, it would be like, it maybe it would be have a lower effect. And then when we come back to the checkerboard essay and uh, for the FIC, it will have a different value rather than just in here. So it's kind of a validation here that we do. Okay. So the idea of the checkerboard assay is to test for synergy. And in this case, yes. you don't see synergy. Yeah, we didn't see synergy, unfortunately. So, so, so just following up again from that, um, in terms of the mechanism of action of your compound, so yeah. alone, the compound is bacteriostatic. But oh, this compound, yeah, this compound is bacteriostatic. The activity comes from inhibiting pen penicillin binding protein. Is that correct? Yes, PBP, yes. Then when you combine it with um, the beta-lactam antibiotic, it becomes um, bactericidal because it yeah. enables the in inhibition of the PBP. So I guess my question is why does inhibiting the PBP with two compounds lead to sidality, whereas inhibiting with only the allosteric inhibitor leads to st uh, static effect? Oh, because uh, so this compound itself is bacteriostatic. When you do that alone, it 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 have some uh, and uh, it have some antibacterial uh, effects uh, both in vivo and in vitro. However, you know we use actually time QSA to determine if, if it whether it's uh, like bacteriocidal or bacteriostatic. So as you can see here, it, it didn't. So the compound itself actually it's not uh, bacteriocidal at all. So when you use it alone, it definitely can't. And for this TZP, if you use it, because it can't actually, uh, so it, because of the uh, the close confirmation of P existence of the PB2A, this thing cannot kill, uh, this, this thing cannot really inhibit the growth of the PBB, uh, of the MRSA as well, only when you uh, use them in combination. So 
this compound, the quinazolone, will do its part to uh, open up the active site, and then the beta lactans can inhibit the site. And then, but once this active site is covalently inhibited with the beta lactan, then it will be anti uh, bactericidal. So that's how they achieve the how how you have this like uh, mechanism changed. That's very interesting mechanism, Courtney. Yes, I have. We have a lot of questions. So, um, question is: Let's see, what is the selectivity of your compounds against other bacteria? Oh, we actually. Uh, so, we actually when we do the screening, also we also screen uh, apart from the SRS. We also screen other uh, S, uh, other uh, bacteria from the S gate panel. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we found is that uh, we also try to feed it. And uh, what we found is that um, this compound is generally just active against the gram positive ones, uh, bacteria, rather than the, and they are inactive against gram negative ones. Among gram and, what type, what other bacteria did you look at? Uh, sorry, I can't think of the name of it, but it's just the E and the S. <laughs> EFO, Enterococcus faecium. Enter, yeah, yeah, yes. I just can't pronounce that. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, yeah, that's the that's the only two I think it's inactive. It and it's not in and it's inactive against it before we test that. I'm gonna ask one more question, Pete. Um, then I'm gonna turn go to you. Another question is, um, I want to switch over to a little PK. Um, is the PK, PK you did on infected or normal animals? Uh, it's normal animals. I think PK, yeah, generally PK was done in normal animals. Okay, can you comment upon the um, some of the PK parameters? You have uh, shown clearance and biomed distribution. Um, can you comment on those numbers, what they mean? If, if those are good numbers, bad numbers? Oh, so for this series of compounds, normally we expect the AUC to be around over like a uh, thousand. It would be fine, and so AUC is on area on the curve. It's different. I just just like I said, it's it's, it's actually just meeting the systemic exposure. Uh, when it's at the metric, it you see how it's like exposure to your to the, the body of the animal. And the regarding clearance, we just see like how it would be metabolized out of the uh, get out of the uh, the the animal body. And uh, normally, we hope that this data is. Uh, uh, like around two. If it's like 20, it's already like a bit too much. Honestly, I think I, I have a bit of a hope on this compound, but we didn't, because of the limited results, we didn't continue on this compound. As you can, and uh, these compounds, as you can see, we choose a different dose because this compound has kind of a solubility issue. And uh, that's why we pick uh, five micrograms per kilo, kilogram rather than the 10 one. So it's uh, relative, not that comparable. So yeah, that's for that. And for this one, for PK, we have more data and uh, we, we can see the T half and the to C, C. So we using this one, we can actually determine like when, when you, oh, we actually, normally we also have like a graph showing that AUC thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can using the, you can using the, uh, you can using compare it, the concentration in the plasma uh, plasma to the MIC to see uh, so the duration of the compound duration of the uh, of the compound to being effective in the animal body. So that's quite interesting when I was doing the uh, analysis during the, regarding the PK. Okay, and great. the other one is yeah the other one is the F here the oral variability and uh, I think normally you want the drug to be taken orally right so if it's higher it's always better. Yes, your volume of distribution is pretty low, so um, that indicates at point two, you know, that's getting close to the volume of, um, you know, plasma or your blood. That's your getting close to the blood volume itself. So it's it doesn't seem, you know, it's just I guess it's just you know many antibiotics also have very low volumes of distribution because they're so polar. But yours is very hydrophobic. I'm surprised. I would think it would have a greater volume. In in the in the uh, you mean in the uh, the fat like all these tissues? Yeah, yeah, because that's point. You know, a typical um, the plasma blood volume for like a mouse is like 0.07, 
um, liters per kg. So that's getting close to the blood volume. Many drugs, you know, are like three to five liters per kilogram is kind of a, a common number. Um, mm. So I'm, I'm surprised it's so low. So it's not distributing as well. Yes. Okay, um, Pete, we do have, um, maybe I'll turn it to you for a last question. Yeah, just following up on the, on your in vivo studies. So what routes of administration did you use for the in vivo efficacy studies? Uh, uh, I think uh, we did it uh, in uh, IV. We just injected through the tail vein. For the, for the, in, for the efficacy studies? Oh, you mean this one, right? Yeah, yes. we injected through the, the tail vein, so it's IV. Okay, and um, was that your, was that, so the question is how did you decide the best route, route of administration for testing the compound? Um, I think normally we will do, normally we will, if, if this, uh, so normally we just do, I think we will do IV uh, to see, so to get rid of all these other effects that will affect the uh, effect, the, the uh, exposure of this compound. Uh, so as long as you uh, administrate the IVLE, you can see those, you can have this, uh, it, it will suddenly reach the, um, in the, the Cmax. So then, then you can have the, you can see how it really works out. If you take it orally, I think there are a lot of factors in play. So maybe, so actually for this compound, we are a bit concerned with a bit of solubility issues. Um, so when we can, so so we don't know like how the way it will play it out in these um, in the stomach of the mice. So to do that, we just always. So normally, generally, my kind of recommendation is that. If you normally, uh, if you can do it, if this is a, um, could you be, you can do it in the formulation of, uh, you can inject it through IV, then you should do it IV first. Then if you have uh, extra like sources, you would, you can, you should try like uh, P, uh, like try PO or to take it orally to see how it play it out. I mean, in, in my experience- In general. Like yeah, you know, it's tough. Sometimes it's tough with solubility doing yeah. IV dosing. So yeah, we often yeah. do IP or subcutaneous dosing. But anyway, that's IP. Yeah, IP. Yes. Okay. Very good. All right. So, Guan Guan, thank you very much. Um, Thanks. Yes, thank you. We appreciate the talk. That was great. We are got the second talk up next. So um, I'd like to introduce Noel Ferrara. Hi, so everyone. for the second talk, you can up share your slides. This, um, again, I didn't mention at the beginning, but um, if you have questions, please type them in chat. And it, as before, we will um, have question session at the end, and we have plenty of time. Um, so Noel, welcome. Thank you. Um, okay, here. All right. Hi, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about a recent publication that we put out in ACSID. Um, this details a novel assay platform that we're calling SacuFlow. Um, I worked on this with my lab mate, Alexis, and we're really excited to share this work with you all today. Um, but first, we're going to start off with a poll question. All right. Thanks, Noelle. So we have another poll question for the audience, which I will launch now. And the question is, which antibiotic was discovered first? Was it vancomycin, penicillin, polymyxin B, or chloramphenicol? So we'll give everyone a few seconds to answer. It might have been a bit spoiled by the first presentation, but. <laughs> and I see the uh, answers are coming in. So we'll wait maybe 10 more seconds. I'm going to close the poll in three, two, one. All right, back to you. All right, good job, everybody. <laughs> um, so yeah, penicillin was the first antibiotic to be discovered in the 1920s. Um, a scientist, Alexander Fleming, saw this mold that was preventing the growth of bacteria. Um, and eventually, we would uh, harvest out the active ingredient from this mold, and penicillin would come to be. Now, following that, 
um, there was really a robust period of antibiotic discovery and development that spanned a few decades. Um, however, the number of new antibiotic classes coming to market has significantly dropped off. In fact, we are in a discovery void of about 30 years before a new class of antibiotics has been introduced. Um, this is for a number of reasons, but a big one is antibiotic resistance. Um, so as you can see, virtually every class of antibiotic that's been introduced is met with resistance from really clever pathogens. Um, you can even see here some of the more recent ones that have come out. We've barely gotten any use of them before resistance is detected. Um, so this is obviously not a great trend. Um, it really highlights the need for the development of more effective antibiotics or alternative therapies. Um, however, in order to do that, I do think it's important to understand how um, what antibiotics even target. Um, so we have some that have been developed um, to work against protein synthesis. So bacterial proteins are important in things like communication and virulence. So you could see where it'd be advantageous to shut this down at a ribosomal level. Um, some work to disrupt the cell membrane and to induce cell lysis. Um, some inhibit DNA replication um, so we can get cell death due to DNA damage or breakage. And then we have a lot of antibiotics that target cell wall synthesis. So the cell wall is basically this fortress that maintains cell shape and integrity. Um, it's home to a lot of biomacromolecules and protects the um, bacterial cell from an onslaught of environmental threats. Um, so the cell wall is so important that virtually, um, excuse me, approximately half of all antibiotics actually target the cell wall um, and more are continuously being sought after. Um, so let's take a look at cell walls a little more in depth here. Um, bacteria can be classified based on the type of cell wall they possess. So we can have gram-negative bacteria, which have this outer, mem outer membrane layer, a thin layer of peptoglycan in the inner membrane. An example here would be um, E. coli. We can also have gram-positive bacteria, which lack an outer membrane, but have a thick peptoglycan layer, um, followed by an inner membrane. An example here would be Staphylococcus aureus. And then finally, we can have mycobacteria, which are kind of unique. Um, they have a waxy mycolic acid layer followed by a thin layer of peptoglycan and an inner membrane. And an example here would be the infamous um, tuberculosis. So you may notice that there is a common feature among all three of these classifications, and that is the peptoglycan layer. Um, so this is a really important component of the cell wall, and I wanna talk more about it, but we're gonna have another poll question first. Okay, I'm gonna pull up the uh, another poll question. Okay, so the next question is, what is the proposed or measured thickness of the peptidoglycan layer in Staphylococcus aureus? All right, the answers are coming in. And again, we'll just wait a few more seconds. Okay, 10 more seconds. I want to close the poll in three, two, one. And here are the results, back to you. All right, so we all got pretty close, at least half of us. Um, so yeah, the right answer here is around 30 nanometers. Um, it's quite thick, so hopefully you can start to imagine what a quite literal large roll um, this, can, this layer can play. Um, so peptoglycan, or I'm going to refer to it as PG for short, um, plays a crucial structural role for our cells, um, our bacterial cells. Um, it provides cellular rigidity and integrity and the shape. Um, it prevents uh, lysis from osmotic pressure. And additionally, it's home to a lot of enzymes and proteins and polymers that are really important to the bacteria. Um, looking at the structure more in depth, we have an alternating sugar backbone. Um, we have our N-acetylglucosamine attached to an N-acetylmeramic acid, or glycnac and myrnac for short. Off of the myrnac unit is a short peptide, often referred to as the stem peptide. Um, I have the sequence listed here. We have an L-alanine, a D-glutamic acid, L-lysine, or an mesodiaminopamelic acid, or MDOT for short, um, followed by two D-alanines. So the sequence can definitely vary. Um, as I said, we can have lysine or MDAP here. Um, and it's usually three to five amino acids in length. length. I'm showing you the five amino acid. Um, and adjacent stem peptides can be cross-linked to each other. And this is going to start to form kind of a mesh-like structure if you have the whole PG. Um, it's a really prominent therapeutic target of our immune system and antibiot antibiotics alike. Um, and in order to find new um, 
PG directed therapeutics, it's really important to understand how molecules interact with PG. Um, there are some studies that do characterize these interactions already, but the type of PG used varies. Um, so what do I mean by that? Um, we're gonna have different types of accessible isolated PG. So starting off, we can have synthetic mimics. Um, so this is something made by hand in a lab. Um, there are some pros to this form of PG. You get a homogenous product and you can really introduce any kind of specific modification to the structure that you desire. Um, however, for a lab with less synthetic expertise, this can become challenging and costly, um, especially because there is a lack of commercial reagents for, um, in particular, MDAP and the disaccharide, and you also lose the native crosslink structure that you get, like polymeric PG in whole cells. Now, what you could do is use whole cells. Um, you will get the native PG in full. Um, which is great, but there is a lot of other components to the cell wall, right? We have membranes, we have proteins, we have all kinds of polymers attached. Um, so you can't isolate the effects of molecules coming in and interacting with the PG alone. Um, so the next thing that we can have then is isolated PG fragments. And so this would essentially require us taking out the PG la layer, digesting it with some enzymes and using those fragments to look at interactions. Um, so what's great here is you are going to get native PG. Um, it will be fragmented, but you'll get native PG. However, it's usually difficult to identify what the products actually are after digestion. So you typically have to purify them. Um, it is a little difficult to purify those fragments and identify um, what's what, and you'll typically get low yields. Um, now the methods used to analyze molecular interactions with any of these types of PGs also vary as well. Um, so typically you'll see the interactions being evaluated by mass spectrometry, some form of imaging, or a pull-down assay. And while these are informative, they are low throughput and kind of difficult to quantify. Um, so what we envisioned was this kind of quantitative high throughput assay where we could use um, the whole native isolated PG or what I'm going to refer to as saculi and flow cytometry for the analysis. Um, so I'm going to take you through a little workflow. This is basically the basis of our SACUFLOW assay, um, even before we bring in any interacting molecules. So we can start with um, whole cell bacteria, um, any strain, and we basically can fluorescently tag the PG layer in the whole cell. Um, then using established protocols, we can isolate out the fluorescent saculi. Um, this is going to reti retain kind of the size of the bacterial cell. It's going to be structurally intact. Um, and so we reason that we should be able to see this on flow, uh, flow cytometer, uh, much like you can see whole cells on the flow. Um, so let me take you through these workflow steps a little more in depth and kind of how we would accomplish each of these. Um, so let's recall the PG structure, right? We have our um, sugar, alternating sugar backbone. We have stem peptides off of that and the stem peptides are cross-linked. Okay, so cross-linking is going to be key to our process, um, our first step of the workflow where we're basically fluorescently tagging the PG and whole cells. Um, so what exactly goes on during cross-linking? Okay, so what we're gonna have is two adjacent stem peptide strands. Um, and what's gonna happen is we're gonna have an enzyme called a transpeptidase come in. It's gonna have this active site residue and it can attack the bond between these two dialanines. It's gonna attack that amide bond. It's gonna go for the carboxyl group. It's basically going to release this terminal dialanine and we're gonna say goodbye to it. And we're gonna get this acyl enzyme intermediate. Now on the neighboring stem peptide chain, we can have a, and a free amine group that can perform a nucleophilic attack on that acyl enzyme intermediate effectively popping off our transpeptidase and forming our cross-link bonds. Um, so now what we can do is we can come in and hijack this process. Um, so this has been extensively shown by our group and others that basically we can start with our stem peptide like we did before. Um, we can come in with a single D-amino acid. So in this case, we're gonna use D-lysine conjugated to a 5,6-carboxyfluorosine, and I'm gonna refer to this as d -lysfl. But essentially, if you can see, this d -lysfl has an amine group here, right? So it can perform that nucleophilic attack I was talking about. Um, and basically, break that acyl enzyme intermediate, effectively stitching itself into the stem peptide. So going back to our workflow, I've showed you now that we can take bacterial whole cells and using this method, we can um, incorporate in our DLACE-FL and we can get a metabolic tag of our PG um, or our saculi and then we can isolate out the sacculus. Um, so just to go over this isolation procedure in, in brief, um, we can heat kill the whole cells uh, by boiling. We come in with a 
detergent called SDS to break up the membrane. We can digest um, DNA with DNA um, or proteins with trypsin. And then if we're using gram positive cells, there are these um, long polymers that are linked to the PG called tachoic acids, and we can hydrolyze those off with acid if desired. Um, so now we did go through this workflow with um, the gram-positive bacterium Staphylococcus aureus, or you may hear me refer to it as Staph from here on out. Um, and we wanted to see basically if we can see the staphyli on the flow. Um, so we started with simply benchmarking the um, fluorescent population of the staphyli um, on the flow cytometer. And as you can see, we get this tight population of events and it's really distinguishable from debris. So that was really exciting for us. Um, we also can look at the mean fluorescence of this population. So we have saculi that's either tagged with d FL or a stereo control, which should not have gotten incorporated into the PG l lice uh, FL, excuse me. Um, and as you can see with the d FL, we have a nice pop in fluorescence over this background. Well, what would become our background signal? Um, we also wanted to do a concentration scan. So we treated um, staph cells with an increasing concentration of d lice FL, isolated out that saculi and looked at it on the flow, and we can see an increase in concentration um, and a corresponding in increase in fluorescence. Um, we also wanted to look at the saculi via confocal microscopy, as you can see in this inset, to make sure that we are looking at kind of this fluorescent saculi um, that we think we are. Um, lastly, we wanted to make sure that this d lice FL is actually like incorporated the way we think into the PG matrix. Um, so we took the saculi and we treated it with two um, PGA hydrolases. We have mutinolysin here in the gray and lysozyme in the black. Um, and as you can see over time, the fluorescent signal of the saculi um, decreases with mutinolysin treatment. We're losing PG fragments. Um, However, with lysozyme, it does not decrease, but this does make sense um, because staph saculi uh, or PG, excuse me, is um, resistant to mutinolysin de degrade degradation. Um, so uh, this was exciting for us to see. We kind of have the basis of our saculi flow assay, uh, but now we want to change it up a little bit. We want to show some versatility. Um, so just like we can tag the PG with a fluorescent D amino acid, we can kind of come in with any uh, D amino acid that we choose. Um, so what can we really do with this? What we decide is that we would tag whole cells with a D-lysine functionalized with an azido handle. So this is now going to provide an orthogonal handle on the saculi that we can react with a variety of compounds um, as long as they contain a corresponding reactive moiety. Um, so in this case, we're going to be using dibenzocyclooctine, uh, octine, excuse me, um, and this the short name for this is DBCO. Uh, this is going to be our reactive moiety. Um, there's many others that can be used. Um, and this is going to be linked to a fluorescein. I'm going to refer to this mo molecule as DFL0. Now, what we're hoping is that if we react the D-lysine, d azide treated saculi with this uh, DFL0, we're uh, going to undergo, long name, but a, a Spock reaction, basically. Um, and so what this is, it's a form of click chemistry that doesn't require copper as a catalyst, um, which is traditional. Um, but this ring strain here, it has this alkyne that is at anything but an 180 degree angle, which is what it prefers. So what it's going to do to relieve that ring strain is react with this azide. We're going to get a formation of a triazole. And if we are getting this reaction on the surface of the saculi, um, we should be able to see that via flow cytometry. Um, so we do see just that. We took saculi from staph cells that were treated with d acido, reacted with the d FL. Um, excuse me, the DFL0, and we have a significant increase in fluorescence over backgrounds um, with our saculi. Now, what's really cool is that this is not just isolated to gram-positive bacteria. Um, we actually did this with a strain of uh, E. coli, so that's our gram-negative bacteria, and Mycobacterium smegmatis. And as you can see, the saculi that's tagged with D-lysozido has a significant increase in fluorescence um, in both strains over the L-lysozido control or um, untreated um, saculi. Um, so this really shows basically the adaptability of our saculoflow assay to, to, to look at various bacterial species, um, which is pretty, pretty neat for us. Um, now, if we go back to the surface of gram positives, um, like I mentioned, there's this dense brush-like polymer called waltzacoic acid. It's well established that waltzacoic acids can impede incoming molecules from interacting with this PG scaffold. 
Um, so we wanted to see if we could examine um, the effects of DFL zero permeation to the PG space in the presence and absence of this polymer. And as you can see, if we remove the wall to coic acid from the saccula, we do get a slight increase in fluorescence, um, which indicates to us at least that we could potentially use sacu flow to examine the role of surface bio biopolymers um, in terms of accessibility to that PG space. Um, so now we want to switch it up a little more here. Um, we want to determine if we can use SACUFLOW to assess um, PG interactions with, with known antibiotics. Um, so we started, we chose to start with vancomycin. This is a glycopeptide antibiotic that binds to the Diala Diala motif on the stem peptide. Um, we took staph sacculi, we incubated it with either DMSO or a fluorescent uh, conjugate of vancomycin. So what we have here is a bodipi fluorophore that's conjugated to the sugar moides on bank. I'm gonna to refer to this as VBD. And essentially, if we have our sacculi um, treated with the VBD, we have an increase in fluorescence over backgrounds, which suggests that the VD, VBD uh, potentially did bind the sacculi and that this interaction is detectable by flow. Now, to show that the fluorescence levels are reflective of a specific binding event, um, we treated the sacculi and the VBD with um, a small tripeptide, a lice diala diala. Um, this basically mimics the region in which bank would bind. So if we add more and more and more of this tripeptide, we see the fluorescence signal of the sacculi drop off um, due to the decreased binding events with VDB and more com competition from the tripeptide here. Um, so then we wanted to show this versatility of this assay with other strains. Um, so what we decided to do is that we would isolate sacculi from two different bacillus subtilis strains. So we have a wild type strain and a DAC-A knockout strain. So DAC-A is the gene that encodes for carboxypeptidase. And in wild type cells, this carboxypeptidase will go around and clip off a terminal dialanine. Now, if we knock this out, we're going to have an increase of this diala diala motif that the vancomycin, um, the VBD, can bind to. Um, so we do see just that if we treat the staphs, the excuse me, the sacculi um, from both these strains with the VBD, we have an increase in in binding events or fluorescence um, with the DAC A strain. Um, then we decided to flip this the other way. Um, we're going to use um, a strain of Enterococci facium um, that basically has an inducible vancomycin resistant phenotype. Um, inducing this phenotype catalyzes the removal of a terminal D-alanine. Um, so that's going to basically reduce the number of binding, binding sites we have for BBD. Um, and as you can see in the sacculi analysis um, on the flow, in the induced cells, we have you know, our baseline fluorescence. And in the, un, excuse me, in the uninduced cells, we have our baseline fluorescence. And then we see a drop with our induced cells as we lose those binding sites um, due to the, the induced phenotype. Um, so this was pretty cool and um, looks like uh, it shows that we can use SACUFLOW to, to basically quantify interactions of PG binding molecules um, with the actual PG scaffold. This could be useful in developing new um, PG directed therapeutics or when analyzing drug resistance. Um, finally, we wanted to put SACUFLOW to the ultimate test um, in a high throughput and quantitative screen. So what we wanted to try to do was find inhibitors of an enzyme of interest. Um, so we're going to start with our enzyme of interest being sortase A. Um, it is a prominent drug target. It functions within Staphylococcus aureus by putting on proteins onto the surface of the cell, um, with many of these proteins being important in virulence. Um, so sortase A works very, in a very similar fashion to the transpeptidases that I described earlier. We're going to have this little peptide sequence here. It's typically referred to as a sorting signal, um, and it's LPXTG. So X can be any amino acid, and this is attached to usually a surface protein of some kind. This gets transported across the inner membrane and pops out within close proximity to our sortase A enzyme. Um, so sortase has an active site residue that will attack between the T and the G, that amide bond, again, going after the carboxyl group, and we're going to say goodbye to our glycine or, or G, and we're going to form, again, an acyl enzyme intermediate between our sorting signal and our sortase A. Now a um, peptoglycan uh, precursor, biosynthesis precursor is going to be nearby. It's again going to have a free amine that can perform um, a nucleophilic attack on that acyl enzyme intermediate, and it's going to uh, basically let, release our sortase A, and this whole building block can get put onto the growing PG wall. 
Um, so what we essentially wanted to do was express and isolate the sortase A enzyme, and we wanted to make a version of the sorting signal with a fluorescent moiety attached here where usually a uh, surface protein would be, um, since that's probably a permissible site. Um, and we wanted to put it through a sacuflow type assay. So what we're going to have is that we're going to have sacculi from staph. We're going to incubate it with our sortase A enzyme and our fluorescent sorting signal. And what we're hoping to see is successful ligation of the sorting signal onto the sacculi, excuse me, onto the sacculi, and that fluorescence should be detectable by flow cytometry. Um, so we did just that, and we do see over time an increase in observed fluorescence um, due to what we hope is sortase A mediated activity to link that um, sorting signal onto the sacculi. Now, what we also did include was a no sortase, the triangles, it's a little hard to see, but a no sortase control. So this whole setup with no sortase, and we can see it's very low background fluorescent levels. So it is a good indication that the, the addition is truly being done by sortase. Um, now what we wanted to do was come in with an inhibitor of sortase A in this whole setup. And essentially what we should see is a reduction of fluorescence or little to no fluorescence. And as you can see, it's in the square here. I know again, it's a little hard to see, but um, it does fall to that background near the no sortase control. Um, and here we, we use the inhibitor MT, MT set. Um, it's a known in vitro inhibitor um, of, of sortase. So these results really encouraged us to then go forward with a uh, high throughput pilot inhibitor screen. So using the same assay setup that I just detailed for you, we were able to screen a library of over a thousand pharmacologically active compounds. Um, what we're essentially looking for again is a sharp decrease in fluorescence. Um, and hopefully that is, is ind indicative of the compound inhibiting sortase A activity. We pulled up about 18 compounds of interest. Um, we decided to pick upon one. Um, so amsacrine has been seen in other studies to be inhibitors of other enzymes, but um, we decided to further test its ability to inhibit sortase A in a titration assay. So we can see the reduction of fluorescence levels in a concentration dependent manner here. Um, and uh, this was pretty cool for us. We, we uh, feel that this pilot screen really demonstrated the uh, feasibility of SACUFLOW to be used in a high throughput and quantitative screen. Um, the results um, also highlight that we could use SACUFLOW to look at enzyme activity, um, potentially find inhibitors, or even substrates of these enzymes um, within the context of the PG space. I'm um, really hoping this paves the way for a new method of drug discovery. Um, and with that, I just want to say some thank yous. Um, thank you to ACS Infectious Diseases, Courtney, Peter, Lorraine, and Mia for all your hard work and, and for this opportunity uh, to present. I also want to thank my, my PI, Dr. Marcos Perez, and my co-author on all this work that you saw today, Alexis. Um, and I really want to thank you all for listening, and I will be happy to take any questions. Wow. Noelle, thank you so much for a tour de force presentation. Um, yeah, sorry, that was a little long. <laughs> that was absolutely was beautiful. And it, it featured a lot of the um, you know, work from the Paris lab, a lot of technology developed over the last decade, all kind of in one assay, which is um, yeah. cool. <laughs> That's all, all the guns here a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did a great job. I um, So I'm looking for questions here. So I'm going to ask the audience if you have questions, please um, type them in the Q&A. Um, we have uh, plenty of time for, for questions. The, um, so this is, this is amazing. I just want to congratulate you on the development of the Sacrifloe assay and the technology. It's just spectacular. Um, and I think you. it has a lot of promise. Um, and so you looked at, you know, can, you know, what are your future goals um, for maybe screening? Um, would you want to look for other, you know, if you looked at sore case as an example, but um, is there any, I mean, large, any plans to do larger scale screening um, to look at enzymes involved in PG um, formation? Or I, I mean, I don't know, it seems like there's a lot of opportunity. Um, yeah, you're, you're, you're dancing around kind of, yeah, something that we, we do have currently going a project to, to look at a PG biosynthesis enzyme um, more specifically, because right, those are highly targeted by drugs. If we mm -hmm. can knock out the PG, we're, we're really going to knock down the cell. Um, in fact, even maybe maybe kill it. So um, we do have a, a assay going. It's a similar vein to what you saw with the Sortes um, assay with the PG biosynthesis enzymes, but don't want to give away too much. <laughs> yeah, no worries. The um, 
also hot for the the sac the sacculus when you digest and you remove everything you know i guess so you're just looking at really the the ex the skeleton um how do you know that you have removed you know all the res all the proteins and all the dna and the you know i guess there's holes in the um cell in this in the sacculus that allows escape and you know do you have to break it up to allow access to like dnas to get inside and so the first step really is a treatment with SDS. So that's going to really blow kind of that membrane component. And, you know, I would say once we kind of lose the membrane, you start to lose a lot of the guts. Um, but the, the peptoglycan structure stays relatively intact through that process. And uh, I would say there's enough permeability in the PG matrix to, to have at least small enzymes like DNAs go in. Um, and trypsin is kind of its own powerhouse of, of digesting protein. So there's, you know, what we could do if we're, I guess, honestly, I'm not sure if I, I can totally say for sure, like, oh, all the enzymes are digested, but they're definitely also denatured due to the SDS treatment. So um, I would say we're really kind of using this sacculi PG skeleton, like you said, it's kind of a, a shell. Yeah, it's like an exoskeleton. Can you let's look at that micros microscopically, you know, through TEM or something? Um, yeah, you, you probably could. Like I said, we did, uh, well, now I'm in this stinking presenter mode. We did look at um, the confocal. So you don't get the, the level of detail, um, but um, I'm so sorry. I seem to can't, can't seem to break out of this presenter mode here. Um, we did look at the, Confocal, um, we recently, let's see, it's not looking up here. Hold I'm wondering on. how the, um, how large is it? What's the molecular weight of, so this is like, it's a sacculus from an, a single intact bacterium. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's gonna be small. <laughs> um, it, it, you mean large, it'll be a very high molecular weight. I'm just curious on, you know, the, the structure of the cell wall is, um, I, the other speakers came from um, Shariya Mabashre's lab, who did some right. simple work on um, a, over a decade and a half ago on the structure of the cell wall. I'm just curious if you'd, your isolated sacculus, if you could use that for structural studies to elucidate, you know, um, or confirm the overall structure of the peptidoglycan using microscopy or cryo EM or something. I don't know. I'm sure you would be able to look at it even. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure people have done like, like people have done AFM, right, on, on some of the pieces. Um, but I imagine you could probably image it. If you can image it by confocal, as long as you can stabilize it, I think that would be the key. Stabilize it without breakage. Yes. Oh, yeah. well, okay. I'll ask, I'll let uh, Pete ask some questions. Yes, so how, how much labeling do you get? Um, what fraction of peptides are labeled and does that have any um, biological consequence? Does it have any antibacterial activity itself? Um, yeah, so it, it's about like one to 2% of the stem peptides will, will be transferred to whatever amino acid you're putting in um, or modified with that amino acid. Um, we have done viability studies. I don't have it on here, um, but basically looking at the, the growth curves and they match completely with wild type. So. Um, I, I would say that they're perfectly okay. <laughs> okay. And um, a question of my own. So I'm very interested in, in time dependent effects. Have you done any like washout effects to look at the, the rate of loss of fluorophore, get an idea of maybe the rate of PG resynthesis, or maybe in your sortes assay, have you done a washout experiment to look at the recovery and sortes activity to get an idea of um, the lifetime of the sortase A inhibitor complex? Um, you know, we didn't really do anything too far into like what I feel like that would be more kinetics. Um, no, uh, I love kinetics, so. <laughs> yeah, I would say we don't really delve into kinetics uh, very deeply. This is a snapshot in time, right? I think, um, is, is it up on the high throughput screen right now? Sorry, I actually can't tell what, what slide we're looking at. Um, yeah, okay, so you, you can see there is some stability over time, but we only really push this, what is 250 minutes? Um, a couple of hours, right? Um, so this is this is, but this but is, this is the, the stability of the, the um, right. this fluorescent. Right, this is in the presence yeah. of the 
of the inhibitor, right? So you could, yeah. you could treat with inhibitor, then you could wash it out and you could look at recovery of sauté's activity. Absolutely. We absolutely could, right? And, yeah. and everything is going That'll to, unless it's covalent, right? We are going to have some, some sort of curve, but. Well, yeah. but, the, but the bacteria could make new sautés, right? Um, sure, if we were doing in, in whole cell. Yeah, in whole cell. But here it's, it's, it's whatever we put in is what we put in. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely in whole cell, this could be a whole different game for sure. All right. I, yes, question. Um, this is from David Hong. Um, how representative or how similar are the PG layers, peptidoglycan layers, between different bacteria? And can we use one as representative? I know you talked at the beginning about like the differences between gram positive and gram negative, but and mycobacteria, but looking at looks like just a gram positive, you know, how similar or different are they amongst all the common gram positive bacteria? Um, you know, there, there definitely are differences. Um, so like I mentioned, like the stem peptide structure, sorry, it would be great if I could go back in slides. Um, there we go, okay. So, it's actually probably showing my background right now. I'm really sorry that is embarrassing. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry that is. You can normally in PowerPoint type in the number of the slide and it will pop up. Yeah, I think that since this is my first presentation in a long time, I'm uh, somehow suffering from some real technical. Uh, you're doing okay. very well. All right, so hopefully you can see. Well, now you're gonna see the wrong sides. Okay, so. Um, in this structure, right, we can have, this is, this is a slight difference, we can have lice type PG or MDAP PG, and that definitely depends on the type of bacteria that you are. Um, and you can also have like subtle modifications, like, like some of these uh, carboxylic acids can be amidated. And what, also, what you can also have is that some bugs don't like to have a full pentapeptide. Um, some of them will exclusively be tetrapeptides, so we lose one of the dialanines. Some of them will be exclusively tripeptides, so we lose both of the dialanines. Some of them don't even have the sequence. Some have glycine replacements that they do. Um, so really, I do think that if you wanted to look at like really specific interactions, like the Vank binding, right, you would need to isolate out the bacteria sacculi that like you are particularly wishing to study, because um, I do think it there's micro, what seems like micro changes that could, could play a big role in those interactions. Great, yes, very nice. Um, so are any, I'm looking for audience questions here. We had, uh, seems like they've not as, not as many questions. Um, I thought the, we'd get a lot of questions for this assay since it's really novel. Um, Maybe, maybe we're just so clear that there's <laughs> no questions. Which you, I, I would say, I just wanted to comment, Noel, that your uh, presentation was really well done and it was it was so clear. You explained for a very general audience. I really um, appreciate that. Just, oh, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay, we're going to give a last. I guess we're already at uh, ten after, so I'm going to give it a last opportunity for any questions. You can post in the Q and A. I'll be happy to ask Noel. I see a couple more. Um, Charles Rice, he's been asking lots of questions. How applicable is the assay to gram negatives with a thin peptidoglycan layer? I'm so, so still pretty active, uh, applicable. Um, right in flow, you only really need 10,000 events for like quantitative, you know, good solid data. So. I mean, honestly, we we barely used all of the material that we pulled out of the gram negatives um, in in the trial that we did. Um, wherever I showed that, um, it's hard for me to remember these slides. But um, yeah, we we barely needed um, all of the material that we get, so you, you get out a lot of uh, PG material from each isolation, even in a ninety six well plate. I've done this, so you can do it in bigger volumes, like almost up to like. You know, hundreds of mils, or you can do it in a 96 well plate, um, even in a three, um, 384. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty translatable. You get a lot of product. Yes, excellent. excellent. Well, uh, with I see no further questions. And Pete, unless you have a final question, um, I think we can close out this Zoom pop up meeting.
Um, okay, so I guess with that, um, I'd like to thank um, Yuan Wan and Noel for really wonderful presentations um, on really very complimentary research um, on different with completely different um, foci, um, one on drug development and one on new assay development. So it's really awesome to see. Um, I'd like to thank the audience for attending and we'll stay online for a few more minutes. So if there's any questions, feel free, um, but thank you all. Lorraine, did you have any final um, thoughts or comments? Uh, no, I don't have anything additional to add. Um, again, just thank you all for joining today and many thanks to Noel and Yuan Wan for presenting. Have a good day, everyone. I think two great presentations and for the community out there, please let us know if you're interested in being involved in organizing, presenting. This is for the community. And the American Chemical Society is very supportive and they can help with the organization. Yeah, so uh, for those of you on, please contact either Peter or me um, and we will uh, we can get, get going. We're planning to do this about every three months. Um, so the next one will be next early next year. All right, I see our participants dropping down. I'll stay on here, Pete, for a few more minutes. Um, looks like we're rapidly declining. And okay. Boom. Very good, both of you. Thank you. Yes. It's a good way to start the day and get a presentation done. Now you can go get back in lab and finish up your thesis. <laughs> okay. Definitely. So, Lorraine, I guess, can we, uh, should we just close out the meeting and will you edit the recording? Uh, yeah, marketing will do that. Okay. I'll go ahead and close out the meeting. Thank you again, everybody. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.